The greatest power you possess is your ability to choose. Join Lowe's Moore as he reveals how you can begin to maximize that power by exploring yourself on the deepest levels and committing to making lasting and positive changes. Get ready to achieve breakthroughs that will lead to accelerated growth and transformation because you are now tuned in to The Blueprint. Good evening and welcome back to The Blueprint. This is Lowe's Moore and man, I'm as usual. I'm excited to be back with you guys for another podcast. Hey, it's been a long couple of weeks. Many of you know that I I did my first, uh, two weeks ago, I did my first live uh, show in Greensboro, North Carolina for the WNBA Final Four, right? And I thought like coming home, you know, after it was a long trip, went through the storm, coming back home and thinking like, I'm going to just, Ooh, that was a long trip (laughs) and and fighting that storm made it even more stressful. But I got back home and my wife's um, uncle, our uncle, the beloved uh, uncle, uncle Sonny, um, a few days later, um, you know, uh, transition. And, and the next thing, you know, we, we were, you know, dealing with, that process. And of course he's from North Carolina. So we had to turn around after a service here on Wednesday, turn around and we had to jump in the car on Thursday and we had to head back right past Greensboro, North Carolina into Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, for, uh, for his, uh, funeral. I mean, it, 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 you know, and, and, and it wasn't the W, NBA it was the WABAs. Don't know. Let's get the mix up. We always get tongue tied when it comes down to WNBA, WABA. But hey, maybe it's a uh, there's a merger going on down in in the future. Maybe. But we were down there and uh, for the service yesterday, um, it was beautiful. Um, me, Ma, Uncle Sonny, uh, brother and sister you know, both going now. And uh, my wife's always said they back together again. So um, let's say to the both of them, rest in peace, man, enjoy each other. And, you know, just, just, it was, it was my pleasure. I had to, had the uh, pleasure of, um, you know, emceeing the service yesterday. And of course my wife uh, did the eulogy and it was a pleasure. You know, it's always a pleasure to send somebody off uh, who had a good heart, you know, if you, if you did something for, for uncle Sonny, he first thing, he was like, hey, thank you, baby. You know, God bless you. You know, it always, he was always thanking you and he was always saying, God bless you, you know? And, uh, so it was just, it was just awesome. We jumped in the car this morning so that we could be back here for the blueprint podcast. Uh, we left at five 30 this morning and, and we got back here, um, around, four o'clock and you know a little tired but it was all worth it it was definitely all worth it and uh to you know to family to uh Mima and uncle sonny man rest in peace and enjoy i mean enjoy each other and you know i want to say before i get started um a couple of friends of mine uh that i've known for some years uh got inducted into the newer shell basketball hall of fame the what not the basketball hall of fame but they got their jersey retired at new Rochelle, new york and i just wanted to mention them and i wanted to say congratulations uh number one to kenny washington kenny was about five eight played for uh you know played for new Rochelle high school and after you know after college was small college and then he went over and he was like 20 some years in switzerland playing professional basketball at 5'8", dynamic. One thing I learned from him, man, is that work ethic is, is, is key. This guy worked hard all the time, man, on his ball handling skills, his shooting skills, his defense, man. And I want to say congratulations to, uh, you know, my good friend, Kenny Washington. And, and also I want to say 
to Jimmy McGee, you know, a legend in New Rochelle, man. Just an amazing, um, just amazing basketball player, amazing person. The, all three of these guys, just amazing people, right? And, um, you know, so I want to say congratulations to Jimmy McGee, you know, uh, on on having your, your jersey retired. And Rashawn Young, what amazing play at New Rochelle High School, went to Buffalo, uh, played at Buffalo, man, had a chance, had an opportunity uh, to try it with the New York Knicks. And, um, you know, hey, just to get the privilege to try out for a professional team is an amazing wow. thing by itself. So to the three of you guys, man, man, you guys are the best. And it's long overdue, right? And next should be the Westchester Hall of Fame, right? And so I'm looking forward to that. I'm sorry I missed it. I had to be away for family matters, but you know, God bless you guys. And you know, so without further ado, I'm gonna drop my I'm gonna drop my pebble. This is my pebble, my little ball here. I'm gonna drop it. Boom. And it's a seed, right? That's my seed, right? My pebble, my pebble in the pond, right? I'm expecting the ripple effect tonight. Uh, this is gonna be an awesome show. Um, and so I just want to move forward. And so let me, let, let me just get started here. I want to start out with my book of the week. Yeah, I did. I, I didn't get this book yet. I just seen it just popped up the other day. I think it popped up on Facebook and I was looking at it and, and I'm, I've studied, uh, Grant Hill, watched him as a young player, you know, growing up, amazing basketball player, you know, but what I didn't know. In, in, in terms of the reviews and the things that I read about this book um, was what I, I didn't know. We see Grant Hill as a Hall of Famer, as multi, you know, you won a bunch of uh, college uh, championships. Uh, we just seen this amazing basketball player, you know, was impacted by injury during his career in the NBA, but coming from an amazing family. Um, and But we, yet we didn't know that when he was a young man, Right. He had a problem with anxiety. He was had a problem with that. He wasn't good enough. And and we're dealing with this today, not just through the because we were in a pandemic or still in a pandemic. Right. You know, he's been dealing with this long before the pandemic. He And he just opens up about growing up, feeling inferior, feeling lack of confidence, fear while he was playing, didn't think he could measure up and that he was good enough. And he played under fear and anxiety all the time, man. So I say I didn't get that book yet, but I am going to get it right. And it's Grant Hill, his his autobiography um, called Game. Right. Uh, you make sure you make sure you get a get yourself a copy of that. Put it in your library. Remember, I'm saying the library is key. Right. You know, build your own library, have a library in your home, regardless of what level you're in. Man, you can start your own library. Right. And start to do be be a part of the team right? That's combating illiteracy, right? So, um, you know, just, just do that. And then here's my word of the week. My word of the week is key, right? We, we know a key is opening up the door, open up the door, opening up a cabinet, right? Uh, you got to have a key, right? And I said, there are keys to success, Right. Uh, Grant Hill talks about a number of those things in his book about his parents, talks about himself. Right. I tell you, there are keys to success. We've mentioned a lot of those keys here on the blueprint throughout the years now. We're, going to, we're in our third year. Right. Keys are important. Having the keys to success is important. Right. And, and that's why that's a powerful, a powerful word is know the key that unlocks the door to the things that you are trying to accomplish. And they're out there. You just have to listen. And I believe that, you know, every week we throw out keys, right? We throw out dimes. We throw out, my grandfather said, we throw out nuggets. Those are keys, key things that lead you to success. Success. So again, um, that's my word of the week. And here's the affirmation of the week, the Hill Harper, Pierce Harper affirmation, quote moment, not having the best situation but seeing the best in the situation is the key to happiness, right? 
right? I, I like that. And and then here's my uh, my music of the week. This is my good my good friend uh, Donald Donnell Collier, and and he man Cardell Donnell Cardell. He got a new Christian rap album out um and his his first single here is a good man right uh, i'm looking i'm looking for I, i've heard it it's tight right you know young fellas say it's tight you know that's it is it, it, really good and and then the movie um the movie of week of the week is uh tyler perry's uh the jazz man's blues right the jazz man's blue I, i've got a chance to see it twice now and I'm, I get a little mad when I'm when I'm watching it, but it's a part of history, right? And and it's something that we should all see. And and then let me do a couple of shout outs here. Yeah, let's do let me do a, a few shout outs here before we get going. Right. I want to boy Aaron Judge has had an amazing year. 62 home runs, right? Um, I was a little disappointed last night in the Yankees because they had a chance to win the game. And right there at the bottom of the ninth inning, they just gave it up. Right. But Aaron judges had a wonderful season. The Yankees have one wonderful season. And for all you Yankee fans, man, let's put our hands together and let's keep rooting that they get, they'll pull this series out. And then I got to go over here to the world championships where the women's basketball team won the championship, man. Congratulations. Once again, Man, I enjoyed watching you guys play. You, you're amazing. Look forward to the the Olympics when it comes, because you guys are gonna be dynamite, right? And then here's my uh, final shout out. Here I want to shout out to Stanley and Leslie Wise, our good friends, man, on their 17th wedding anniversary. I want to shout you guys out, man, and. Hey, they're our stop. They were our stop on our way to North Carolina. We stopped there and it was crazy. We stopped in the middle of the night, like 10 and 30 at night, stopped overnight to get a little sleep in and got up in the morning. And when we got there, they had lamb chops waiting for us, man. I mean, lamb chops, you know, sauteed broccoli. I know if you're hungry out there, I'm going to make you hungry. You know, baked potato, man, it was just awesome. And then on the way back from Greensboro, we stopped in again and they had man Baltimore's finest crab cakes, right? I'm like, man, I'm gonna stop by there again, man. Every time I stop by there, I get some food. You know, that's the my my good friends, uh Stanley and Leslie Wise. My wife uh played high school basketball with Leslie. They grew up together. They won the first women New York State women's championship in basketball. Awesome, right? Awesome that they remain friends. And then to my brother, Doug, I want to say happy birthday to you, man. Now, you know, man, you getting old, man. You know, I thought I was getting old. You getting old, too. But to Doug, man, happy birthday, man. Love you. And uh, I wish you many, many more. All right. And then next week, we got Javon Booker on next week. Um, founder of the Ampity Basketball Program. Right. He's on the USA amputee soccer team, right? What a beautiful guy, man. You know, if you want to be encouraged, man, man, check us out next week, man. Cause you, you know, you know, for all of us that have everything, we, you know, we can see here, run, jump, all those kind of things. And, and life is good for us. Right. But, you know, I'm always amazed at those who have disabilities, right? They have disabilities and man, they don't let it get them down. They use what they have, you know, and, and Javon is going to be, man, he's going to come on, man. He's man. He will encourage your heart next week. So I look forward to seeing you guys there on next week. I'm looking forward to seeing Javon. He just got back into the country this week and with the soccer team. And he is, he's an amazing guy. So I look forward to seeing you there next week as well but let us get rolling here you know i'm gonna show this little highlight here and then i'll introduce my guests and we're gonna be rolling for this evening
Awesome. Well, my guest for this evening is Herman Bulls, and we met at the Jimmy V Foundation Golf Classic. Uh, woo, it's been, it's been about what three weeks ago, a month ago? Yeah, it's about a month ago. About a month ago. Yeah, and and let me say this, Herman. Um, you know, I meet a lot. You you meet a lot of people, right? Of course, in 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 my former career. And even in as the executive director of Boys and Girls Club, I meet people, you know, and uh, I'm when we, we were on the same golf team, me, you and uh, my guest I had a few weeks ago, uh, the magnanimous, the energetic Wes Matthews was on here a few, a few weeks ago. Nobody had more energy than Wes. And we were on the golf. We were on the same golf uh, team together. And I, I tell you, it was a pleasure to play golf with you. It was a pleasure to meet you. It, we just had we just had a great time. I mean, um, you know, I didn't know I was going to be privileged to 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 uh, play golf with the person who was the honoree of the V Foundation Golf Classic. I didn't know I didn't know that when when uh, when Larry put us together, I was like, hold on, he's the you know he's the honoree. What, what the what a privilege and oh, then oh, that, to that, meet a nice human being oh my god that's because i needed some help playing with you two professional athletes and i'm just <laughs> a country boy from alabama <laughs> no that that was awesome we had a real good time um you know we even thought we had a chance to win i mean we were playing pretty good golf yeah it was a yeah. great team effort it really was yeah we I, but i knew we weren't going to win because I think we were seven under, seven under. We probably could have been eleven or twelve under. Yeah, but... we missed we we missed a few putts. Yeah, just a few. And yeah. um, I, I was thinking like, there's no way in the world we're gonna win seven under. You know, somebody always coming up with fifteen and twenty under. But I mean, the day was just special, man. It was just a great time, you know, spending, getting to know you, you know, getting to hang out with you, and then immediately after, man. I mean. You know, um, it, it touched my heart because you immediately after you text us both, me and Wes, to talk about it, the privilege of you playing with us. And now I, I was touched by that because I was like right instantly, right away. We I felt like, man, man, this is a you know, we 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 started an instant friendship right away. I enjoyed myself. Well, I really appreciate that. And, um, you know, seeing your introduction Lowe's, uh, you mentioned Grant Hill and his new book, and many of your listeners may know that his mom um, passed away, unfortunately, Janet Hill, and she was, uh, you know, I met Grant through her. I don't know him very well, but Janet and I were very good friends, and for you listeners that don't know, you talk about a role model. She was one of the very first uh, African-American females who served on corporate boards. And I had the privilege of serving on two boards with her. One was the um, B2B, which is a group here in the Washington, D.C. region, is working on getting more females on corporate boards. And uh, she and I were the only people of color, uh, just to be more specific, Black people that was on that board. And I got to tell you, she just had a way of articulating for inclusiveness and doing it in the right way. And then the other board that I served on, on with her for five, maybe seven years was the military bowl board, which is mm. the uh, uh, NCAA football game that's now played down at the Naval Academy. And she and I were uh, probably in the second year uh, when that bowl game came into existence. Uh, she and I served on that board together and she represented, we had the uh, ACC at the time and we had a representatives from each of the schools and she represented uh, Duke from the ACC and I represented West Point. Oh, nice. Wow. I did small world, right? It's a really, small, <laughs> yeah, really, small. Definitely. you know, and I don't, I don't know either. Um, but, um, in terms of his father, uh, at the time, besides being always a New York fan, I was a Dallas Cowboy fan. So Calvin Hill, uh, his dad was just an amazing football player. Um, not only just amazing football player, but uh, amazing person too as well. I mean, you know, um, and then to see him and his wife and then, you know, then Grant, uh, 
who I, I met Grant once. Yep. Actually, uh, I used to do chapels um, for for the Nets. And, um, you know, in a pass by, somebody introduced me to Grant when he was playing. And, um, yeah, just the nice, just the nicest person, man. Yeah, well, the yeah. entire family. And you can see Grant should be the epitome. Um, and certainly Lowe's, you and Wes have done great things subsequent to your outstanding collegiate and pro careers. And Grant has just been phenomenal. Author, obviously part owner of the Hawks. Uh, NBC, NBA analysts, uh, done a lot of uh, investments in real estate, uh, as has uh, the Admiral. David Robinson also has a, uh, a pretty institutional real estate firm that he's working with. So uh, the, the, the key, and I hope some of the things we talk about tonight, not only for those professional athletes, but for everybody out there, it's about planning for your future. And there are things you can do today that will make you more prepared for tomorrow. Awesome. Well, we, we're going to get rolling here. And you know, usually before we get to, you know, to the business side of things, you know, we want to get to know Herman Bulls, you know, uh, and I think it's important. Well, three things I think is important in regards to the blueprint is the importance of family, mm -hmm. the importance of faith and the importance of education. So uh, talk, talk to us. You mentioned you mentioned to us earlier you Alabama boy. I mean, I, I want to just apologize for yesterday. Oh. <laughs> you, I, I, I'm sorry painful. Alabama went down yesterday. I'm sorry that was about painful. that. However, it's not over yet. And as you know, uh, it's not over till the uh, till the end. And uh, if you want to get those losses in, you got to get them in early. And they've got to be good losses. And that <laughs> okay. was a good loss, okay? Because probably what's going to happen is uh, – Georgia's going to uh, beat Tennessee when they play later this uh, year. And then Alabama will play Georgia in the SEC championship game and win. And they'll be back in the playoffs. It's kind of that. <laughs> uh, I, I sense a little optimism here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so talk about growing up and, in Alabama, that whole, you know, the whole experience. And well, mom well and it was, uh, you know, it, it, we're all from somewhere and we uh, should and can be proud of where we're from. So I'm from Florence, Alabama, and I was actually raised in a suburb of Florence, which was Killen, and the suburb of Killen was Sinister, Alabama. And uh, you probably won't find that on the map, but I'm the youngest of seven kids. And uh, unfortunately, Lowe's, you and I did talk about this much, but I never met my father. Uh, my father was a uh, laborer at TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority, which is the big utility down in that area. He was basically a janitor. And in addition to that, uh, also an entrepreneur. And I think that's where I got perhaps some of my entrepreneurial genes. And uh, for that, he basically had, farm, had a couple of farms uh, that he did uh, after work. And he was going um, in October of 1956, he was going from one farm to the other and you had to get on Highway 72, which is a main thoroughfare there. And unfortunately, an 18 wheeler ran into his tractor and uh, he was killed uh, mm. instantly. So you talk mm. about faith and a blueprint. My mother at the time had six kids, uh, age, age, ranging from, let's see, my older sister was probably 12, 14 years older than me. So from 14 to uh, a little baby in her womb, and uh, at the time, she had not finished high school and was basically working as a domestic. So you talk about, you know, certainly not a feeling of being poor, but we, we were not in the middle class and certainly not in the upper middle class. <laughs> However, um, as I understand it, people uh, you know, in the South and you've got some Southern roots that you talk about going down to North and South Carolina. And, you know, it's all about family there. And people would say, well, Lucibel, we'll take one here. That was my mother's name. We'll take another there. And she said, nope, going to keep my family. And I got to tell you, Lowe's, uh, you talk about perseverance. She continued with three jobs uh, over the time, uh, continued to be uh, a domestic, cleaning people's house, white folks' house, as they say. And I can remember as a kid, kind of maybe four or five going around with her and you go to these, you know, large houses, uh, so to speak, and you see the kids toys. And it was like a dream. It's like, Oh my gosh, look how these people live. And then uh, she was a cook at a restaurant there called Lakeview. And then she also sold insurance for Atlanta life insurance company. 
So oh. she did all of those things. And then when I was in about the uh, third, fourth, fifth grade, she went back. By the way, I didn't mention she hadn't finished high school. So right. she went back and got her GED. And then after that, when I was in probably the fourth, fifth grade, she went to uh, back to college and became a licensed practical nurse. And if people think they have it bad, um, probably from where we live to Decatur, where she went to school, it was probably about 70 miles round trip that she did three days a week while keeping those three jobs doing that and finished that program probably in a year and a half, maybe a couple of years. And from there became a nurse. We moved from the farm to the, the city, so to speak, of Florence. And I was a little lame, lanky seventh grader. And probably the best thing that happened to me is I made the basketball team. They had already had the tryouts, but the coach said, you know, I'll give you, give you a shot at it. And I made <laughs> that team for seventh and eighth grade. And you know, when we're in junior high school, a lot of your authority and leadership kind of comes from being involved in things and, and, and um, in the South sports and football and basketball is it. So then going to ninth grade. And so I go to ninth grade, this is 1969, 70. Mm. And you can imagine. So I go up for football. I can remember, let me go back a little. I remember going out for peewee football and uh, this would have been in 68, 69. I said, Hey, I want to play quarterback. And the coach said, Oh, you're over here. You're going to play guard. <laughs> okay, yeah. well, the guard uh, put me to guard. But however, in the ninth grade, uh, we went to the high school, uh, you know, it was the high school in 19th, 11th grade. And, uh, you know, football is the first season sport of the season. And I said, Hey, I'm going to go out for quarterback. And sure enough, I went out for quarterback and was the starting quarterback on the freshman team. And then uh, sophomore year, I didn't start at quarterback, but I lettered on a varsity team and defensive back. And by my senior year, I was the uh, first full-time starting quarterback uh, at Coffee High School in Florence, Alabama. And that doesn't sound like anything today, but you got to put yourself back in the time period that that mm -hmm. was. Because as Blacks, we were not supposed to be smart enough to play quarterback. And mm -hmm. the, the, the quarterback was one thing. But in addition to that, when I graduated, I held the uh, record for high jump. I also lettered in basketball. I couldn't do it as well as you, Lowe's, but I, <laughs> I actually played baseball a couple of years. And what's probably more important that really set me up for life, uh, in addition to being in the National Honor Society, I was also e elected as uh, president of the student council. So, and this is a school wow. that was 16% black hmm. back in, 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 in the mid seventies. And then from wow. there, uh, had, had some opportunities and probably the best none military academy opportunity I had was to go to Vanderbilt and they put some things together. Uh, I got a letter from Alabama back Bear Bryant was there. But <laughs> they were mimeographed, you know what I'm saying? And they said, right. sent thousands of them out, but Alabama never really recruited me. However, another uh, famous person that we all know that graduated uh, from letter, uh, uh, the same from Leeton high school, the same year that I did, it was a young man that, uh, played tight end for the Cleveland Browns and later became the general manager of the Ravens. And that's Ozzie Newsom. Oh yeah. He awesome. and I graduated in the same area uh, from the same year from, uh, from high school. And Ozzie of course went to Alabama and became a legend. And I went to West Point, uh, was recruited there as a quarterback, uh, played quarterback uh, in and out on the freshman team. And in the sophomore season, uh, moved to defensive back because we had a, a young man who was uh, actually started and played some as a freshman. And Homer Smith was our coach. And Homer, passed Homer Smith. I remember Packers, Homer Smith. So. Yeah. Uh, those of you, <laughs> some of your listeners may know, he was at uh, uh, UCLA, Princeton grad, probably the most, uh, one of the most intelligent coaches <laughs> that they would <laughs> the pros or, or, or the uh, college ranks. And of course, he went out to UCLA, offensive coordinator, offensive coordinator at Alabama for a while. And he called me in one day, Lowe's, and it was probably, uh, this is a kid, you know, I'd been involved in sports my entire life. Mm. The time I went home after school was when there was a basketball game and we'd go home. Other than that, you know, I was involved in the sports and obviously I had the, uh, the student council activities my senior year. And he in uh, at, at, at West Point at Army, it's all about the Army Navy game. And he said, Herman, you're never going to start in an Army Navy game. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it really hurt Lowe's, uh, you know, and I again, I knew I had some athletic ability. 
and you and I play golf. You can say I got a little. I got a little yeah. game. Yeah. Oh no, you got a real nice game, man. However, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we playing Division One football, uh, and and let me tell you, I was on the scout team my sophomore year. I'm gonna tell you, probably the best thing that ever happened to me. And let me tell you why. Uh, the scout team makes the team, as you know, because uh, you got to do things to get get the uh, the varsity ready. Uh, and I would see individuals that had certainly more talent than I had. Mm. One of the things that I had was determination and desire and effort that I would give. And I think that translated later into my life, uh, uh, because after I finished uh, uh, playing football, and one of the things I did at high school as well, I had a radio show in West Point used that to recruit me. And I was uh, a DJ at, Re at West Point. <laughs> I went over to the sports. And for my last two years, I did the play by play of Army basketball and Army football. In addition, uh, and plus, I was able to study more. And we'll talk about where I went to grad school. And that's certainly <laughs> I was able to put a little more effort into books, because, as you know, being a division one college athlete and for you guys that played basketball, I, I just don't say how you did it with all the travel, but with football, you know, you are there and you get back to the barracks, uh, you know, seven, seven o'clock and you've got the same academic program as the other cadets have. And we, That's right. We, mm -hmm. we really stay with it at army and the basketball being play by play was pretty neat because I got to meet another person uh, that you know very well. And that's Mike Krzyzewski. So yeah. Coach K was the basketball coach at West Point at the time. And so I traveled with the team. His little girls used to sit on my lap on the bus rides. And, oh, man, you really did your work, didn't you? <laughs> K and I uh, really became very good friends. And I'm actually on the board of his Center of Leadership and Ethics down at Duke. I'm one of the board members of that. So I uh, generally get to see him at least once a year uh, for that. So, uh, so that's kind of the West Point thing, really. Uh, concentrated on the academics and did very, uh, did a lot better. And I, I did okay my freshman and sophomore year, but this is something about uh, academics and standards across the nation. At the time, Alabama, and I probably finished fourth or fifth in my high school class. However, I went to West Point and I remember we were taking computer class, Fortran, COBOL. Some of these kids from the Northern schools had already done this stuff. And I'm looking there saying, what is this? <laughs> 48 or 49 and Mississippi was 50. And it took, uh, it took a time to acclimate and uh, for making probably C's and B's the first year, uh, maybe a few C's and mostly B's the second year. And that those last two years making A's and B's in all my courses was uh, fantastic. And obviously not playing sports, you had more time to get mm -hmm. it. And uh, graduated, uh, went out to the army and uh Probably one of the best things that happened to me was going to the Army that I was able to meet my wife there. Uh, we met at our first assignment, which was at Fort Dix, New Jersey. Okay. And, uh, she was uh, Iris Burton Bull. She was Iris Burton at the time. And uh, I had a great job. Uh, she got there. We met in probably uh, January, February of 1979. And in uh, uh, June of that year, I had a job where I went back to West Point. West Point was very focused on minority recruiting and I was what they call a project outreach officer. So I was recruiting blacks, minorities, I should say, but primarily blacks in the Southeastern United States. So I'd go on mm -hmm. for two weeks, give speeches. And I tell you, I, I attribute a lot of my success to that job even as well, Lowe's, because I would either talk to one person or up to 2000 people, mm -hmm. radio, TV. So getting that opportunity to, to go out and present oneself uh, and, you know, be confident. That was a great learning experience and uh, couldn't help but ask her to marry me. And we got married <laughs> in, in 1980 and that's my wife, Iris. And uh, just real quickly, uh, your, your, your visitor uh, viewers will note that that was a, a headstone tombstone. Unfortunately, uh, Iris, just a phenomenal lady. We were married for over 40 years and our, our journey went from, Fort Dix, New Jersey. There we are on Broadway. Uh, then we went to Korea for a couple of years. And uh, while we were in Korea, we both had great Army records going. So the Army sent both of us to graduate school. Uh, she went to Tufts University up in, uh, in the Boston area, and I went to Harvard Business School. And after our graduate work, we went back to West Point, 
where she served in the admissions officer and was responsible over her career there uh, in getting over <laughs> a thousand cadets into West Point. And she spent wow. two years doing a regional job out in the uh, Great Lakes area. And then after which she did the minority recruiting for two years where she was responsible for mm. uh, focusing on minority cadets coming to the academy. And I taught finance and economics. Then we came to Washington where we are now. And by this time we had three kids. Uh, we got three boys, uh, Herman Jr. Uh, he's there on the right. And he is also a West Point graduate. And he had the opportunity to go to West Point, uh, has defended our country. He's actually a lieutenant colonel in the Army now, doing great things for our nation. He served three combat tours, one in Afghanistan. Mm. He did two in Iraq. And he did a great job in the Army. So the Army sent him back to Duke uh, for his mm. MBA. And he actually went back to West Point and served in the admissions office, very similar to what his mom had done. And uh, he's now in Chicago after uh, his last combat tour. Mm. He's out in Chicago now uh, doing the digital marketing for the Army, working with the Army's uh, wow. um, uh, advertising agency doing the digital marketing. And he, he, one of his best things that he did for us is he's the father of our three grandkids, uh, <laughs> Connor, Connor, Kennedy, and uh, Quinn, there they are, who, who are the just the, the love of our life, uh, <laughs> and his wife, Jen. So they're out in Chicago. Then my middle son is Nathaniel, and all of my sons played collegiate sports. Uh, they were oh, all nice. Athletes. They were all better athletes than I am, even though in golf, uh, maybe the <laughs> youngest one can handle me now, but the other two probably aren't close there. But uh, Nathaniel, uh, in high school, he was lacrosse, uh, football, as well as wrestling. And he's the mm. second from the left there. And he went to Earlham College, where he played football for a couple of years, three years, matter of fact, and he did track. And uh, he is now down in the uh, North Palm Beach area in Florida, and he's working in the healthcare uh, area, and he's looking to change industries as we speak. And then the youngest, uh, Jonathan, uh, also went to West Point, and where I played football at West Point two years, Jonathan was able to play all four years, not only that, but play in a bowl game. And he was probably one of mm. one or maybe two African-American punters in the uh, – uh, in the NCAA Division One, He just had a great career punting. And in high school, he was, a, I thought he was a better baseball player. And the day he came home <laughs> to play baseball, I was uh, very uh, shocked and a little disappointed. However, he did basketball as well as football in, uh, in high school. And again, went to West Point, did a great game, played in a bowl game. And he got out of the Army, medically uh, retired. And he uh, went to Duke for his MBA as well. And he's now in sales. Uh, with Microsoft out in the Dallas area, doing a Dallas area, doing wow. a great. So the journey, my wife and I, we came here. By that time, we had three kids, and uh, both of us got out of the army. Uh, I went into real estate with a uh, firm, LaSalle Partners, where it's JLL, and I'm still with that firm to this date as uh, vice chairman of our America's operation. It's a New York Stock Exchange company, over 100,000 employees. We're in over 75 countries around the world, and. We help organizations with their real estate, whether they need to to uh, acquire it, manage it, or dispose it. So everything in between, we help them do. And yeah. Great, great uh, clients all around the world. And my wife went uh, back into government, and she started working family policy issues with Department of Defense. And uh, Lowe's, we're, we're just so proud of her. She was selected by President Clinton to be the number two, she was the uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense for Manpower and Reserve Affairs. And it doesn't sound like much, but when you're overseeing two million people, she was the number wow. two person responsible for Army uniformed and civilian uh, workforce around the world. And uh, she mm. did that for a uh, year and a half, almost two years. And then after that, she went and helped set up what is called the Army Language and Culture Office where she worked in that office for uh, probably over 18 years total, mm. uh, deputy director, the type of person she is, she was, that she didn't need the starlight. We were a, a, a perfect combination, the two of us. <laughs> and, uh, she she uh, did that. And unfortunately, uh, from the picture that you showed on, on May of uh, uh, 2021, um, Iris passed after a valiant 
16 month battle with pancreatic cancer. And, wow. Um, we were married at West Point. The picture on the left there shows our wedding day at West Point, the, uh, the chapel there. And this particular picture uh, was actually taken at West Point because that's where she's buried uh, at West Point. And you see on her on her tombstone there at the very end, it says all these great awards she had uh, to include the highest award that DOD gives out to a civilian she received when she retired in 2020. And uh, Grammy, however, was the biggest award and being Grammy to <laughs> yes. And and Kennedy was the, the 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 biggest thing in her life, but uh, I'm gonna tell you, she was in just fantastic shape. I mean, I call myself being in good shape, and you can see from my kids there, they're 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 all pretty buff, I guess you would say. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and she, she she set the example. I'm gonna tell you that the doctors had said when she was first diagnosed that uh, you know they didn't think she was gonna last maybe 30, perhaps 60 days. And I'm going to tell you, she lived for 16 months and 15 and a half of those months were fantastic to include her going for golf. And we took one last vacation before COVID hit us, uh, took the family down to uh, to Disney because she wanted to make sure Kennedy went there. And uh, pancreatic cancer is uh, unfortunately a disease that, uh, you know, over a 10 year period, the survival rate is close to zero and over five, it's, you know, still in the teens. And most people, um, you know, probably within a year, um, unfortunately, don't make it. However, her her health, her fitness, uh, we have not had processed food in our house and, you know, in 30 years because she got onto the health kick very, very quickly, worked out uh, five to six times a week, beautiful lady in beautiful shape. And uh, we're just, you know, it's, it's a loss uh, that we can't get back. And uh, you talked about the three things that are important, uh, you know, family, faith, and the education and family. I can tell you, um, you know, I talk to my sons at least every week. Uh, Nathaniel, and I had a long conversation on, I was in New York on Tuesday. He's getting ready to transition to a new job. Uh, they, Nathaniel and Jonathan and my uh, brother-in-law, Mac, were with us last week. We do things together. We went out to uh, watch Army play Wake Forest. Unfortunately, that didn't turn out well. <laughs> we went out to uh, to the Panthers, a uh, friend of mine over there, was president and hosted us. And we went to uh, see the Panthers at the on field experience and the owner's box and all that. So it was a lot of fun. So family is important. And even next week after, well, matter of fact, this 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 weekend coming up, uh, Jonathan and Nathaniel and I will be going up to West Point. We're going to go to the West Point, Louisiana Monroe game. And for them, uh, I'm on the board of trustees at West Point. So, I mean, the board, of, I'm sorry, the board of directors of our AOG. Uh, and I've been up there several times since her, um, since her burial, but the boys have not been back. So it'll be emotional for them. Mm. We'll go and uh, talk to Iris. And I do it every time I go up there and give her an update on everything that's going on and <laughs> know how much she uh, worked uh, to really make this family what it is today. And she's been phenomenal doing that. Yeah. Awesome. And, and, uh, you know, I've, I've been to West Point a few times, um, a special place, unique. I mean, you can go to any kind of college, you know, you want to go to, but it's just something unique about West Point. I, I mean, yeah, I, you know, I, I've uh, had the opportunity to, you heard me, you know, I was there four years as a cadet. You heard the one year I spent as a um, admissions officer there. Then I spent three years active duty teaching finance and economics. And when I left active duty lows, I stayed in the reserves and I spent 18 years uh, on the staff as a reserve officer. And it was basically a contingency in the event that there was a, really, really big war. And we had to take all those young officers at West Point and send them off to, to defend our nation. Uh, I was part of the contingency plan that would go back and keep West Point operating. And uh, the, the fun thing there is that uh, when both of my sons were there as cadets, uh, I was able to uh, surprise them and be their guest instructor for a day. So, that, Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> How was that? Well, well, for me, it was cool as a proud dad, but for them, uh, you know, your kids want to do it on their own. And uh, I think I think they were like, you know, they were a little shy. And even Jonathan, I can remember uh, my wife and I were 
you know, pretty major donors to the Army Athletic Association. So matter of fact, the trip we went on this weekend was a donor trip. But when Jonathan was playing uh, every year, we'd go one trip. We would travel with the team and it would be so funny. We'd get on the plane, you know, the, the donors we get on first and go up in the first class and then the, the uh, uh, players would get on. And Jonathan's friends, hello, Mr. Bowles, how you doing? Mr. Bowles, how you doing? And Jonathan, he just walked straight on and <laughs> I, as if you didn't exist. Uh, and I understand they don't want to uh, be singled out for something that's not a result of their efforts. But, yeah. Yeah. I West think I, a good place. I'm trying to think. Of, uh, I think there was a trainer up there. Uh, Spiker, Striker. I forgot. Yeah. Now, he, coach was Spiker. He's down at, uh, he's down at Drexel now. Uh, okay. But this this guy was a trainer because he was a trainer at West Virginia when I was there. Okay. And I'm thinking like my, I don't know if it was my daughter or my wife or we we were up at West Point, and um, I think my daughter was either recruiting or new, and he was a trainer at the time. Okay. But he was at West Virginia. I, as far as I know, he's still he probably still there. Okay. Hope he know. brought some of that discipline to him. You. Oh, you probably did. <laughs> <laughs> you, you you probably definitely did bring some discipline to him, especially at West Point. And and I was up there a few times because you had a boys and girls club uh -huh. on, on on campus. And so for those who had families, uh, you know, their kids in the after after school program used to go into the boys, the boys and girls club there. Well, I got to tell you, we're on a, you know, and I told you earlier, I'm on the board. And one of the things that uh, our strategy is right now is we do a great job reaching out to the community. But, you know, all those people, the millions of people that are in New York City, which, you know, George Washington Bridge is about 37, 38 miles away. And they're in Manhattan. So we're in the, in the process now of doing outreach programs. And we're really starting locally, uh, Lowe's. And you'd be really impressed at what we're doing with the local community. We're starting with some after school programs because the workforce at West Point lives primarily in that community. And these mm -hmm. are great middle class jobs, if you know what I'm saying. However, they're not, uh, you know, the, 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 the people are, you know, middle class, or lower middle class. So, as you know, the education, which you, you know, you talk about family, faith and education, the education is so important. And what we're doing is actually uh, purchase the building. And we're, this is our Association of Graduates at West Point, which again is a private nonprofit organization. And mm -hmm. we're having after school programs and we have coordination of programs with the academy that cadets are able to go over and do tutoring for these Oh, kids. nice. Give them snacks. So it's really much of the same things that you're doing in the Boys and Girls Club, but we're doing it, branding it as West Point because this is why. We know to keep West Point strong and for our civilian faculty and military faculty to want to be there, we need a strong community surrounding West Point. And to the mm -hmm. extent that we can make sure that, that the school system is very strong and we're even going to do some things working with the uh, some of the real estate um, um, around town to make sure that we bring some, I uh, want to be careful with my words, but a little more sophisticated review of what is it that we do with this treasure being West Point and the fact that, you mm -hmm. know, they need to, to eat and do other things when they come and visit and how can we even get more visitors than we have now, which is already, I think, the number one tourist attraction in the state of New York. Oh, awesome. Yeah. yeah. I played, I played golf up there too. I was, I was in a, a golf outing up there at West Point. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. as you know, that's uh you got to hit them straight up there. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, they may be off down in the in the in the tree somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This course and that course uh was was built with uh prisoners of war from World War II. And they helped basically chop the side of that mountain off to uh put the golf course in. And as you as you know, it's just a beautiful, beautiful Oh yeah, no, it, it is absolutely Gorgeous. I wouldn't want to be out there if it's raining, but um, <laughs> it, it, it was all, it was already a little chilly when I was out there. But but if it rained, I'm like, oh, this is not good. But uh, no, no. Be beautiful. Uh, just just amazing. The history and, you know, when you're looking at it and, go and taking it all in, 
you know, when you well, see, well, you know what, and and that's one of the things that I'm I, I'm proud to have gone there. It makes me feel good that two of my kids have gone there, and then the the kids like I where was I? I was last week. Matter of fact, I was at a uh, I was at the Wake Forest game, and we mm-hmm. were at the booth there, and the young guy came over talking with. He's now an uh, investment banker down in. New York City, and he said, uh, you know, Mr. Bowles or Major Bowles, Colonel Bowles, whatever he wants to call me, because I went from captain <laughs> to colonel. I retired as a colonel. He said, you taught me, um, you taught me personal finance. And one of the things that you taught me about was the Roth IRA. And here's my wife here right now. I'm going to tell you, I am so glad what you told us because we did it and we are just in great shape. And, and Lowe's, I know you work with a lot of young people. And when you see them, come back because I probably taught because I sometimes did a, uh, uh, a lecture in large auditoriums. I probably touched, I don't know, four or 5,000, maybe, maybe 10,000 cadets over my uh, 18 or 20 years mm. of teaching there. And, you know, they all kind of look the same, right? Haircuts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the same. Uh, however, it just means so much when they come back and remember you and tell you something and that opportunity uh, we certainly want to make sure it's for all Americans, but however, we also want to make sure that, uh, those, you know, I came, you know, I told you the, the, the foundation that I came from certainly mm-hmm. ethics and work ethic involved in it. However, it's about what you're doing, awareness of opportunities and yes. that's one opportunity. I'll tell anybody out there that's interested in it. It's not easy. Okay. But nothing worthwhile is easy. However, the fruits of completing that program, it's just uh, phenomenal. And I'm, I'm uh, again, have been on the board there for over 20 years. Uh, a lot of my philanthropy goes there. As a matter of fact, uh, in my wife's honor, we have uh, uh, set up a, a, a couple of things. And one of them was at West Point. And what she wanted to do is in the Department of Foreign Language because she was responsible for language policy for the entire DOD. Mm. And uh, one of the things that she wanted to do is make sure that minority, black, particularly cadets got involved in language and culture. So we've uh, we're funding an endowment that will allow cadets over the summer to get immersion going to different countries. We did that at West Point Mm. and did the same. We did the same thing. And fortunately, she knew we're going to do one at West Point before she passed. Uh, but she negotiated all of the deal with Virginia State University, where she went to school. And we have a similar program there where, uh, you know, her focus is wanting to get young black people uh, exposed to language and different cultures. And that's sort of part of her legacy. Oh, nice. You know, very, very nice. Is, is there uh, like if somebody's on tonight, some young person, some parent on tonight, uh, is there like uh, something we can put up on if they're interested in West Point? Oh, oh, God, definitely. Uh, you know, I got to tell you, I, for your listeners, I got to tell you, it's so, so important. Uh, I would uh, I would welcome them to, to even contact me and I'll get them in contact with the uh, with the admissions department. So uh, you can have your listeners uh, contact me and, you know, I may get a hundred and something emails out of it, but that's just active <laughs> every day. And and I, I think we can. We can we can we can make it we can make it happen. So uh, be happy to. But but uh, in, in addition to that, if anybody would just uh, Google West Point or Google West Point admissions, and you will get uh, directed to the process. And now th- th- there's a little mystery around it, but it's not really mysterious. To go to West Point, you do have to have a congressional appointment. And you know, some people say, "Oh my gosh, I got to do all this stuff. How do I get it done?" Well, the reason behind that I think is important. Uh, as you know, we had this thing called the Civil War, and uh, we want to make sure that our officer corps, and the same at the Air Force Academy and as well as the Naval Academy, we want to sh- make sure it's representative from every state that we have. So as a result of that, based upon the number of uh, Congress uh, men, senators and representatives that are in each state, they each get an allocation to make an appointment. Now, the appointment doesn't mean that you're entered. To West Point because you still mm-hmm. have to qualify, and we're looking at basically three specific areas for qualification. And obviously, the academics is important, the physical is important, and that's the you know uh, running and being able to do all those great things. And then uh, Lowe's, what we're really about is we're the premier leadership institution in the world, 
And from that, one of the things, for example, I think over 80% of our uh, in, uh, cadet entrants every year are, 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 are participants or a letter winner in a sport uh, for that. Mm. Okay. And uh, that that's part of the leadership and probably 20 to 30% were in boy state. Uh, you know, 10 to 15, you know, probably 20% were valedictorians and salutatorians in their class. So we're getting great kids. And I don't want to discourage anyone, Lowe's, because we also have a prep school. And part of mm -hmm. what I did when I was in admissions is was going out telling kids in the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade about West Point. Hopefully they would get a little excited about it because you need to start taking classes in the ninth grade so that you've had trigonometry by your senior year, so mm. that you're able to, and you got to have the other sciences, you got to have a foreign language. And we have a lot of people that find out about it a little bit too late. And we have the West Point Preparatory School, which is located on campus at West Point. And for those individuals, and we use it for athletes, I'll be straightforward with you. And we also use it for soldiers coming out of the army because we want that upward mobility there. We see kids with great leadership ability. We want to inspire them to come. And we also use it for minorities. And that's an idea of what they're able to do. It's an intensive one-year program where they concentrate on what? English and math. Wow. To get yeah. them to go into the academy. Uh, yeah, I understand. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Good information. And I think it was that Ray, Ray Russell. Yeah, that's my sister. <laughs> She's out of Alabama. Yeah. So she you say yeah. hi, baby brother. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. You know, I'm the youngest and you you never, you never escape being the youngest. <laughs> you never escape being the oldest either. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I'm the oldest in my family, so you never escape. It, it started getting a little weird, man. Uh, yeah, you know. well, I was trying to get my uh, my brother in law, MacArthur, to 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 Mac. Are you on? Did you were you able to push the button and see Lowe's show here? I listened to it, but I wasn't able to push the button to see it. Oh man! Uh, <laughs> you did good. Now you could you should just push the button on your iPad and Lowe's. It's pretty simple, right? Push the yeah, button. That's right. Just yeah, just push the button. He, uh, they checking out YouTube. I think. I, I yeah, or you just click it and you're in it. You know, uh, you know. As we transition, I, I mean, you know, the first part of this is just amazing, man. Uh, you, you know, getting to know you and your family, and and and, you know, this was just an easy. We didn't have all this conversation, but we had. 18 holes can get you a lot of conversation. <laughs> That's the power of golf besides yeah, playing. The power of golf and, and Lowe's, you, you need to, I don't know if my sons are listening or not. If they are, maybe they'll come up, but you need to tell them how I played that day. <laughs> oh, no. Let me tell you something. When we, <laughs> when we were in a, you know, some people say a pickle. When we was in a hole and we weren't doing good, Herman would just come up with these shots. <laughs> Right. And and then these putts. Oh, he no. In basketball, they say he well, he was balling. Well, he was balling in golf. That's what he was doing. <laughs> well, you know what, Lowe's, I always say is uh you, you become a product of the people you hang out with. So I gotta tell you, having the opportunity to hang out with you and Wes that day. Uh yeah, and I gotta I'm gonna be very honest with you. Um, and we'll get to it a little while ago. You know, I serve on some pretty powerful corporate boards and you go into these boardrooms and, you know, I'm the little country board from Alabama. And then you're looking there seeing all these uh, uh, famous people. Like I'm on a board with Henry Kissinger as an example. And, and you walk in and it's, uh, you know, the golf with you guys at first, you know, say, you know I'm sitting here playing with two professional athletes. <laughs> and as you know, uh, you guys are freaks of nature, right? You're less than 1% <laughs> of the people that try to do this, even in college where these guys are very, very good, but less than 1% of them are going to make it into pros. And you guys had these phenomenal uh, careers. And, uh, uh, you know, Larry Fitzgerald is a buddy of mine. I golf with him and the, the bus, Jerome Bettis, you know, and these guys are just phenomenal athletes. Larry took up golf like five or six years ago. And as you probably know, he won the uh, pro-am out at, um, uh, out in California. At, uh, he, he's a perfectionist, though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He is and everything he, he does. But, but, but to be, so my point is 
kind of walking into the day and you know that you know the butterflies right any athlete knows the butterflies. yeah yeah definitely without a doubt i i had i had some butterflies uh kind of being there with you guys and then what i had to say same thing i did and by the way uh three weeks ago i won my final match play for my club and i won my flight of match play oh congratulations that is that is nerve-wracking when you gotta you know you gotta (laughs) make the shot it's sort of like playing with you guys you gotta make the shot under pressure and uh, I tell them the, uh, you know, the quarterback has to do that. And of course you saw the wife, uh, the picture of my wife. And another saying I have is the quarterback gets the pretty girl. And I certainly got that. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> uh, so we're going to transition a little bit and talk about business. I want to show this video and then you can talk to talk to us about business, uh, JLL. But I want to show this real quick and we can just jump right into it. Me? Yep, loud and clear. I'm rocking back and forth. Is that bad? Want to say hi? What does a better world mean to me? All right, let's go. I like it. It's a good question. I think about this question quite a lot. Let's see. A more connected world. And do something to help each other. Community. The world where everybody's included. Respecting the differences of one another. A world where most decision makers are making those decisions with people, planet, and profit in mind. Create meaningful impact in the communities that we work within. JLL has always been a bit of a leader in just sort of doing the right thing. Our commitment to ethics, for example. Our clients are actually asking about our diversity. We have an opportunity to make a social impact. Our business resource groups help us be more well-rounded as a company. You can't ignore the big challenge that we have, which is climate change. Real estate has uh, a pretty major footprint. The real estate industry is part of the problem and hence is also part of the solution. Is the biggest opportunity that our generation is going to have to make a positive impact in the world. Clients and client companies, they're actually just people at the end of the day. We can create good investment returns at the same time as doing something really positive. Being a global company, yeah, we have access to so much technology and so many resources and best practices around the world. We're all here to strive to do better, so we should be working together. The biggest asset JLL has in, as, as people. It's so much more than a job when you're part of things like this. It's an obligation. It, it, it is our job to do this. So. A better world is a sustainable world. A diverse and inclusive world. A happy world. A healthy world. An equal world. A world full of innovation and creativity. A world where we work together. A world that rewards curiosity. A resilient world. A connected world. A better world is not not. 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 Is not. Not is not optional. So, Herman, uh, business, you talking about all this work, professor, and then somewhere along the line, you transition, right? Uh, getting into business entrepreneurship you had mentioned it earlier with that your father has you know this in him is part of his genes and and is probably a part of you so talk talk a little bit about business you got look like got a few of them out there going on (laughs) thank you and first of all thank you so much for uh, showing that brief film and that was something we put together because the one of the biggest things going on in the in the business community now is something called ESG and that stands for environmental, social and governance. And we'll go into that. So the environmental and sustainability to make sure that certainly for my grandkids and your grandkids, that we're going to have a planet that is there for them to live in. And, uh, and I'll go over some of the things I'm doing in business to set, definitely help uh, support that. And at the same time, you saw in that um, 
uh, clip that we talked about the importance of diversity. And that's something that I've just been a proponent. I'm in several uh, situations and I've got a you know saying to whom much is given, much is expected. And I know you step up on these issues and I'm not a guy that, you know, I got there and, you know, I'm at the top, whatever the top is that you define for yourself. And I'm just going to sit back and enjoy the fruit. So I take, I, I continue to take risk and risk is anytime you do something that's uncomfortable, right? And you have to do that in the boardroom. You have to do that in your community. You have to do it in your church. You have to do it everywhere you are. So the business aspect for me really happened. Having the privilege of going to the Harvard Business School was phenomenal. It's uh, we, we, we call it the West Point of business, right? You know, so <laughs> yes. West Point, I went to the West Point of West Point and I went to the West Point of business. And while I was a student there, uh, leadership is so important. And I told you in uh, high school, I was president of student council. West Point, I was a company representative, uh, kind of in the student government. And when I went to Harvard, I actually, you go there the first week and you're in sections of 90 people. And I didn't know much about this, but you run for basically section president is, is what it's all about. And I said, huh, I didn't even know anything about it before I got there. I said, hey, I'll do it. And five different people ran in my section. And at the time, I'd had as many as 110, 120 people working for me. So it was no big deal being up in front of a crowd. And the first person got up and kind of read everything, didn't look out to the audience. The second person, you know, just walked back and forth looking down at so time. I was third. And I got up and I had like five pointers on a, on a three by five card. And I walked around like I owned the room that I'd done in the military. And one of the great things about West Point and being a leader in the military. And in the end, we finished. When I finished my speech, uh, the class, you know, 90 people, in the, they got up and gave me a standing ovation. Mm. And, you know, we've only known each other for 10 days, maybe two weeks. Uh, and um, at, at this point, I won on the first voting with five people. You know, you had to have a majority. And I won on the first round. And as a check and balance at the midterm, if they made a mistake, somebody can challenge you and you have to go for another uh, uh, election. And I'm proud to say nobody challenged me. <laughs> so <laughs> I could be on the student government for my entire two years there. And part of that, it got me into the business. Um, I didn't know anything about real estate. Okay. And what happened for the second year, this course in real estate, there was only going to be one section. And these kids who came from, you know, Ivy League schools, they come from consulting, they knew everything. And at the time, the tax laws were such that it was very favorable to invest in real estate. And they were ready to revolt at Harvard Business School because there was only going to be one section of real estate. And part of my role in student government was to work with the administration to get another section. And we did. And I said, hmm, there must be something going on here. Where there's smoke, there's fire. And as a result of that, uh, uh, we got another section, actually two, two additional sections, and I signed up and got the class and I fell in love with real estate. Uh, and again, Harvard teaches in the case method. It's not just theory, but hey, here's a situation. You got a piece of land here and what do you do with it? And they, they, they emphasize or you thinking about the humanistic aspects of solving a problem in addition to the technical aspects. And that's what makes, I think, Harvard Business School graduates so successful. And taking this course and reading these cases every time, I just became enamored with it. And when I went to West Point to teach, um, one of the things that I did, there were one other West Point, uh, I'm sorry, West Point and Harvard graduate and another uh, individual who also had an M MBA, we basically put a real estate limited partnership together back in 1986, 87. And I'm here to tell you today that it was a flashing failure <laughs> whatever happened to me at the time my wife didn't have curtains and you know i probably lost you know 70 80 90 thousand dollars in it and i just said hang with me baby i'm gonna do something good one of these days <laughs> Doing, putting that deal together and just learning how that works was uh so important to me and the the the, the disappointing thing to it is we had family and friends that we raised the money from Mm -hmm. Actually, for about a year, year and a half, we did not their approved Harvard Business School solution, which is just put it into bankruptcy and go on to the next one. But we actually funded it ourselves and we did not dilute the other investors. And wow. we did that for a year, maybe a year and a half. And then finally it came to a point that it just didn't make sense. 
Uh, however, that gave me the uh, real estate bug. And when I left the Army, as I mentioned before, I looked at uh, management consulting, I looked at investment banking, I looked at real estate. And uh, real estate, I talked to a few firms here in Washington, but uh, had met the um, uh, CEO of JLL. And I'll never forget, we talked about kind of uncomfortable situations. So I'm there in Chicago, they're headquartered in Chicago. So I'm in this, think of the firm, you know, wood panel office, kind of like my office here now. And just that, you know, you walk in, it's like, oh my gosh, I've never been anything like this. And <laughs> I'm sitting there with the chairman and, and, and this was me, this little, uh, you know, associate there getting ready to evaluate the hire. And I said, Hey, you know what? I haven't run into a lot of black people when I've been doing this. And he, oh, well, blah, 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 blah. And that guy, he became one of my best friends named Stuart Scott. Unfortunately, he passed about four or five years ago. And uh, that was kind of the start in the corporate world of certainly it's okay to ask questions. And it was an uncomfortable question for him. And he said, oh, we, you know, we can't find him, blah, blah, blah. And it was really hard to get hired in development. And that's what they hired me for. And I was hired and my first two projects were uh, one in Baltimore called 414 Water Street and another one in Wilmington, Delaware, which was a, uh, a headquarters bank building. And let me tell you, it was uh, during 89, 90, which we were in a recession then. And I learned a hell of a lot because you learn more when there's not much water in the river and you can mm -hmm. see the rocks and see how they're there. And uh, development became very, very hard to do. And, uh, you know, most firms uh, got out of development and I went into asset management and that is where you overlook the properties that you own and you're the owner making ownership decisions. How much should you charge for the leases? When should you redevelop, et cetera, et cetera. So I had a portfolio at the time was about $750 million. And today that'd probably be about three or $4 billion of properties here in the Washington DC area. And I was one of the few blacks, matter of fact, kind of the only black at that level in Washington, D.C. And I met a friend of mine named Hugh Allen. And I saw Hugh when I went down to the, um, uh, where did I meet Hugh? Uh, I met Hugh during the Congressional Black Caucus this uh, past mm -hmm. week. I was at that event. And Hugh and I got together and had lunch. And we said, you know, we don't see him out of blacks. Let's, let's send an email out to everybody we know. And let's start an organization. And long story short, we started an organization called African American Real Estate Professionals. And I'm happy to say that two weeks ago, I went to the formal event for that. And there were over 350, 400 people in the room uh, in tuxedos and suits. And that's an organization that I started with you. And I was the first president for two, uh, two years. And we now have chapters in Atlanta. We have them in uh, Philadelphia, starting one now, Boston, uh, Los Angeles, uh, as well as San Francisco. Wow. And, and it's and that's the start of getting uh, because real estate is really a relationship business and getting young people involved. And I'm happy to say there are a lot of people whose uh, career that I have, uh, you know, certainly helped help start in this past week. I mentioned I was in New York City. There's another organization. You do this. So after American real estate professionals, you can Google it in the major cities. And we actually start with people that don't know anything about real estate. And you're able to network and connect with people to learn about the industry. I'm going to tell you, it can be a very, very lucrative industry. And there are a lot of things that go on in the industry, everything from building management and maintenance to leasing, to financing, to property management, uh, to, to, to financing capital markets. So it's a wide variety of things that you can do in that industry. <laughs> and we actually started another organization and I went to that meeting in New York state called the real estate executive council and this is made up of more senior real estate people and it is a national organization and we had over 400 people at our event in new york city this past week from all over the nation oh awesome so, and that, that group another organization your listeners should know about that group was fashioned after another group called the executive leadership council and uh elc.com and your, your your listeners should certainly look at that one because that one is made up of now when i joined it was probably the top 100 now it's the top 800 african-american executive african-american only blacks are members uh in the uh in actually in the world because we have people from europe now so people like uh, uh ken Chenault, uh you know american express ceo mm -hmm. uh, uh kevin uh, i mean uh, frazier who was at um um Merck, uh, for example, is a member. Um, 
We had uh, the first black C female CEO from Xerox, Ursula Burns. Uh, she's a member of it, et cetera. So it's uh, all of uh, all of these current black CEOs. And that group is uh, phenomenally powerful, Lowe's. And it just brings yeah. that the, the, the importance of connectivity. And we just had our our major uh, gala event for that two weeks ago here in Washington. And uh, um, uh, my, my, my good friend, Marvin Ellison from uh, Lowe's and Lowe's is a client of mine and I oversee that relationship <laughs> with DLL, but he was selected with what's called our achievement award. And I'm, I like to be a little modest about this, but two years ago I was selected for that award and Ken awesome. has won that award. So it's a phenomenal uh, opportunity to uh, get something from your peers that looks at your lifetime achievement and what you've contributed to business as an African-American. Yeah. And I think my, um, yes, my, I think my wife, um, if, if she can catch some of these, let's see if she can catch, uh, what was the first one? The first uh, one? African-American real estate professionals, mm -hmm. the REP. The second one was the executive leadership council. Mm -hmm. right. Those were the two that I spoke about. And yeah. oh, I also talked about Reese, the real estate executive council, real estate executive council. Yeah, those are the three organizations. And uh, all African Americans. All African American organizations in this uh, professional world. So I went into real estate, went in JLL, uh, had a, uh, you know, worked hard, uh, had the opportunity to uh, make manager director, I think, by four and a half, five years. And then my, the entrepreneurship uh, kind of came out because I founded and almost single handedly at initially uh, ran an organization we call our public institutions practice. And that practice today, probably for the firm overall, is probably a billion dollars in revenue. And mm. when I started, it was just me. And I had to convince the firm to do this. And this is looking at federal, state, and local governments, colleges, universities, and not-for-profit organizations. So we did uh, billions of dollars of work, for example, advising the Army the Air Force on housing privatization. And those are deals that I... Uh, you know, was certainly we had a team, but uh, I had the vision to see how that works. We've done phenomenal work with colleges and universities. So major projects I worked on at Georgia Tech, University of Pennsylvania, Ohio State. And uh, uh, we've worked now on over, you know, 250 college campuses. Awesome. Uh, one of the yeah. first statewide outsourcing real estate with the state of Tennessee. And I still oversee that account today after 10 years. So. That that's where I, I I interact with uh you know the governor and uh, <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> the treasurer and all these people uh, where you're doing and one of the things that I've really been working on uh, and it's been tough I'm gonna be, be be honest with you but we do so much work with colleges and universities uh, I know that HBCUs need this type of assistance because my clients <laughs> are Penn and Cornell and Harvard and Stanford and uh, you know. Uh, Wash U and St. Louis, all these, you know, why are they getting support and assistance in these uh, areas to help them with their real estate? And it's something that I've been committed and I've got our firm focused on helping HBCU. So I'm doing work right now at uh, uh, doing work down at uh, Morehouse. We've certainly uh, done work at Tennessee State University, uh, Spelman, Clark Atlanta University, Howard, et cetera, et cetera. So I think these organizations uh, definitely need this assistance because in any organization, your top three um, cost components in your budget are going to be your people, real estate, and technology. Mm -hmm. that's look right. at they're going to move the needle. You look at those. So um, uh, that's how. And, and then and then I continued. That worked out very well. I went uh, actually took a sabbatical from. Um, from JLL and went out and started a company that uh, Bulls Capital Partners with Fannie Mae as uh, my partner and my capital sources were SunTrust Bank, which is now Truist and Goldman Sachs. And I built that firm up and sold it about eight or nine years ago. Uh, so just been yeah. here for <laughs> just and, and, and then, you know, then having this opportunity to start doing corporate board work, which has been exciting to this day. It keeps me active. Right. I, I was just at the uh, it was a historically black college uh, golf out in Virginia. Um, a gentleman by the name of Curtis Simmons mm -hmm. uh, go. I think it's HBCU go TV. Okay. They, they're doing this live streaming now 
of all the sports and activities that are going on, um, you know, as well. Curtis is just a great guy. I used to work for uh, BET. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, I actually saw that. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I saw that they were putting that together. Yeah. And um, he's also working. What's what's the gentleman's name that bought the weather, the weather uh, station, the weather channel? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, oh, uh, God, he was uh, a comedian. Yeah. Byron. Byron. Yeah. 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 And Byron has actually become a partner with him. Right. Right. And as well. Yeah. I, I think that's, you know, I think that's a big that's going to be a big thing for historically black colleges without yeah. Byron, Byron Allen. Yeah. yeah Byron Allen. It's, yep. it's going to be a that's going to be big. I, I, it has to grow, you know, um, historically black colleges have to grow. They have to develop. Yep. You know, and um, here's a funny one for you. When I was at West Virginia in my sophomore year. Um, and Lord, why don't you let some of the listeners are going to listen to this and they're not going to know your background and they may know, but you got to tell them your background, not only playing at West Virginia, but playing in the pros. Well, yeah. Well, of course, after I, after I finished, had an, oh, a wonderful year. Uh, four years at West Virginia University, you know, becoming an All-American. I got drafted by the New Jersey Nets. Um, and then I played with New Jersey, Cleveland, and the L.A. Clippers. Um, and I have some amazing coaches. Uh, and I did a little sp sprint in the uh, CBA as well. And uh, Phil Jackson, um, George Call, uh, mm -hmm. to name a few, Paul Silas was my coaches. You know, and I played in the area from 80 to 88. And uh, yeah, just had a wonderful, a wonderful time. Wish I could have stayed longer, you know. Uh, yeah, I was, those, I was those just, contracts got bigger and bigger, didn't they? Yeah, Bill Musselman. I was just telling them at on Saturday. I was like, man, I was born at the wrong time, you know. So <laughs> I, I was looking at the Facebook. It said, uh, uh, Jordan Poole, uh, hundred and forty million. I mean, you yeah. know. Uh, and and, and you know, people don't even know who he is, right? Yeah, and Wiggins, uh, you know, 109 million. I'm like, man, average salary when I when I was coming up was 40 45 thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> now we talk about millions, you know. Oh, yeah. But here's a funny thing I was my going into my after my freshman year, I'm going into my sophomore year, and the coaches are telling me, like, hey, you the guy, you the man. And they bring me a poster just, you know, as a preseason. And it says, low. It, it, I got to say this real quick. When I was a little kid, I did not like my name, right? Because I, I got called all kind of knows more, Lois Lane. I mean, I got called every kind of name you could think of. And I hated my name. You know, I want to be James Brown. He was he was like the man, you know, call me James Brown, you know. And, and then one day my mother said, man, you, you know, one day they're going to say Lowe's more, you know, like that. I was like, oh, get out of here, mom. You know, and 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 I used to stay awake from Mount Vernon to uh, Plymouth, North Carolina, just looking for my name, Lowe's, on the Lowe's. store. Oh, well, I, I thought I, I thought it was coming. I thought it was coming around the corner, you know, like just staying up all night, just trying to clean my eyes just to see my name and lights. and. And when I was a sophomore, uh, Morgantown, West Virginia had Lowe's. And it says, they brought me a post that says, Lowe's presents Lowe's. Oh, I love it. Well, you know, <laughs> as I told you, Marvin Ellison, who's the CEO of Lowe's, is a black man. And okay. he was also previously CEO of JCPenney. And, uh, uh, you know, we'll have to send him a, a copy of this. And if they had name, image, and likeness back in your day, wouldn't Ooh. this be a great one for Lowe's to do, right? It would have been perfect. I mean, even now I'm trying to get out and speak on my experiences and combat combating illiteracy and um, yeah, just getting out there telling the story, man, you know, hey, and the importance of reading. That was in my book from the Boys and Girls Club to the NBA. One of the major things I talk about is that we all have um, you know, weaknesses and my weaknesses at the time was in order to be a athlete, to be a good athlete, I had, I realized that I had to learn how to read, mm -hmm. you know? And so I went on this, you know, most people that read the book, uh, will know that I had to go through this process before I became 
a student athlete or if I was going to ever achieve the success that I had, I needed to handle my business in the classroom as well. But I had to learn how to read first. And once I learned how to read, uh, my wife will never let me go near a Barnes and Nobles Mm -hmm. or any of these places. And that's why I'm I'm fanatic about getting on with the book of the week and telling people to build their libraries. Yep. That's important. And and I hope that, um, you know, some of your listeners are some of these kids who are athletes now. And even though someone like you who was, you know, in the best, all American, went in the pros, but that doesn't last forever. Right. You got to have other things you've got to do. And that's why we were talking about Grant or Grant Hill earlier, you know, kind of the epitome of, uh, you know, going to school, studying, um, making sure, you know, David Robinson, Naval Academy, even though he went to Naval Academy, I still, uh, you know, there, boy, I look a little, little shorter than uh, David. <laughs> uh, I got a lot of respect for David and what he has done and the things that he, um, uh, gets done. And just for these student athletes out there who are in high school and you, you have to look at the numbers, use your athletic ability as a means to an end, as opposed to thinking that is the end. And if it happens and you're fortunate enough to be a Lowe's more and make all American and go to the pros, great. However, for the majority of us, that is not going to be the way the story is going to end. Mm. Yeah, and I love it when the NCAD, NCAA says, you know, everybody's going to go pro in something. something. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love that. And, and, and yeah, we all have gifts, right? Um, and regardless how, how good you are as a singer or a dancer, actor, so forth and so on, you can't do it without getting that education. No doubt about it. Matter of fact, you talked about that, uh, that commercial a really good friend of mine who went to the Air Force Academy, Chris Howard. He was all American running back at Air Force and uh, was uh, president of, um, let me think about this here real quickly, but uh, Chris is now uh, like the chief operating officer at Arizona State University. Oh, awesome. Which is obviously, I think by enrollment after Ohio State or either them or Ohio State is the largest, um, you know, institution of higher learning in the United States. And Chris, uh, he was a Rhodes Scholar, also a Harvard Business School graduate. Uh, so happy this year he got on his first corporate paid board and just a outstanding young man. And he's in those commercials that uh, you just talked about. Everybody, uh, everybody uh, is a pro in the NCAA. And Chris, uh, big, big shout out to you. We're so proud of everything that you're doing. And by the way, he's African-American as well. Awesome. And so we got a curiosity. Well, we have some pictures, but we also have a curiosity question because we got a picture here for you. (laughs) (laughs) And not everybody gets to meet the president, you know. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. So I think this particular time, uh, fortunately, I had the opportunity to meet him several occasions. So one of I'll never forget, I was playing golf and a friend of mine, Marty Nesbitt, who was my colleague at uh, JL, Jones Lang LaSalle, LaSalle Partners, and he went out and you've probably seen these parking spot uh, uh, parking places around airports. He worked with the Pritzker family to pull that together. He had a business plan to put that together. Marty is one of President Obama's best friends. I'll never forget. I'd never heard of, uh, yeah, I'd heard of you know Senator Obama sort of, but I didn't know much about him. I remember the whole I was on and Marty called and said, hey, Herman, buddy of mine's going to run for president. And, you know, your first thing is, okay, Marty, what is it? Yeah, hey, and one of the things we'd like to do is uh, get into the ELC, the Executive Leadership Council organization I told you about, and, you know, let him tell a story. And we were able to arrange that to happen. And uh, I'm not going to say that I'm uh, big buds with the president, but we've met several times. He's actually a member of my golf club here, Army Navy Country Club uh, here in Washington. And you know when he's out there even today because – there's a hold and hold or two in front of him, hold or two behind him, and the Secret Service <laughs> still there. But that event um, was a few years ago, and we uh, he hosted the Executive Leadership Council in the White House. We had mm. the opportunity to get there and uh, uh, get there and talk to him, and uh, it was oh. it was great. And I, I was over for another time. Um, uh, I don't know who I was meeting with, uh, but anyway, I was in the White House, and probably shouldn't have happened. I was. 
in the east wing and a buddy of mine um was in the west wing and they said i'll oh, just go on over so i went over to the west wing to meet with him lewis caldera was his his name and he ran he's a classmate of mine from the uh military academy and he's also a harvard law school harvard mba joint degree owner he used to be uh, president of the university of new mexico so he's well he's doing a lot of corporate boards now but i was going over to see him in the military office and as i was going uh from the east wing to the west wing uh you know uh, michelle was coming in from remember the dog they had uh, mm -hmm. yes she was coming in from uh walking the dog and i i'd never met michelle and uh i had the nerve or whatever to say uh, <clears throat> uh first lady obama because i was also going to see uh, a friend of mine who was head of the white house social office that i had gone to um Harvard Business School, Desiree Rogers was head of the social uh, office. So Lewis and Desiree. So, yeah, when you, remember I said you become a combination of the people you hang out with. So That's right. these yeah. are my friends that I'm hanging out with. And the first time I met Michelle, I've got this business aspect. So we talk and I said, hey, uh, you know, I, I think I might have mentioned I'm going over to see Desiree. So that kind of got her attention. And I said, hey, Marty and I are friends. And uh, we talked probably 45 seconds, maybe a minute, you know, all of this took place. Mm -hmm. and, and this is probably one of my most embarrassing moments, you know, in business, <laughs> your, your instinct is to take, go into your uh, coat pocket, get a card and give it to her. <laughs> so I did that. And she just looked at me, she said, uh, uh, I don't do that. I don't take cards. <laughs> so I went and had my two meetings and then Lewis Caldera took me over to the white house mess to have uh, lunch. And I've got a picture. Uh, matter of fact, I've got this picture. Uh, and I don't know if it'll show on the camera, but uh, this is the president and I in the White House mess. Uh, okay, about, we can see. <laughs> about 45 minutes after that encounter I had with, uh, with Michelle. And, <laughs> and, and, and uh, Lewis, again, this was very early. So, it may have been, it may have been the second time I've met him. You know, you meet him once, you know, he's meeting millions of people, thousands of people anyway. And uh, I said, yes, 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 Mr. President. And yeah, I told him I'm a friend of Marty's and my wife. She said, oh, you're the one that Michelle just told me about. <laughs> <laughs> he had gone back up and I guess he had been in the, in the quarters and she had had said she met him in, in any event. But uh, having an opportunity to be around history like that, is it's just it's just phenomenal it's yeah my wife was saying she noticed that obama's hair was black <laughs> oh in this picture <laughs> no yeah. in, in the other one. <laughs> oh, the other way yeah yeah because yeah. well, by, by the time he left it, it that thing was like yeah. white well, well, tell your wife to look at my hair too because that was yeah. about 12 years ago oh <laughs> uh, yeah he you know of course he graduated from harvard as well yes yeah and and we got a couple of other pictures we just want to throw up here real quick before we get out of here Oh my God. Uh, yep. That's my beautiful bride. So we were out at uh, the montage, which is a great event. As a matter of fact, the event we were at, and this is something your listeners should be aware of, uh, it's by invitation only, but it's a black directors conference. So we get together the uh, top African-American directors. And we just had this trip about uh, three weeks ago or a month ago. And this year, you know, one of our speakers was Elon Musk as an example. And that's the, the the quality of the people that we have uh, that put that together. So our our buddies out at uh, Aerial Management, John Rogers, and um, uh, helps put that together. Melanie Hobson, if your members don't know okay, who yeah, Melanie yeah. is, Melanie is uh, she's chairman of the board at Starbucks now. And she's on the board at J.P. Morgan, and uh, that's it. So the picture you just put up, uh, everybody knows uh our favorite sportscaster there oh yeah spn and gary still uh he was the first black person to letter in football at army was actually drafted was a receiver and he recruited me to west point to play football and oh. so so sage obviously is gary's daughter and uh gary's west pointer and a very very dear friend and uh somebody that's meant a lot to me over the years yeah, I see Sage every day, you know, ESPN, when after first take comes, she, they come on right after that. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, awesome, man. And then um, I think we, we have any more? I think. Oh, my gosh. So uh, 
the one on the top is the uh, Mark Esper. Uh, he's a West Point graduate. And he was the former Secretary of Defense. And the one in the bottom, the gentleman on the right, uh, Bill Murdy, uh, he's just been a mentor of mine for many, many, many years. Uh, went to West Point, Harvard Business School as well. And he helped me get on my first corporate paid board. And then, of course, the individual in the middle is the uh, former superintendent of West Point, And he had uh, three stars at the time. And he is now a four star general and is doing just a fantastic job uh, at being a role model for young men and women out there that I hope want to go to West Point or Annapolis or even Air Force uh, Merchant Marine Academy and have opportunity to get a fantastic education, phenomenal leadership experience and put a foundation down for the future. Awesome. I think my wife had one. I think she had uh, another qu quick question on. She asked about mentorship. Um, I mean, look, I, I think if uh, everybody has a brand, right, we all have a brand. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, my my issue with mentorship now is uh, I have to do it in larger groups. <laughs> I will get and probably as a result of this, I'll get, you know, I, I get. On a, like this week, I did a, a panel uh, and did some mentoring in New York City for an organization called Connected Women. And this is a group that uh, I've been involved with for probably eight or nine years. And they're trying to get more female attorneys on corporate boards. And mm -hmm. uh, I go to an event like that and there are 20 people there. 15 of them are going to connect with me on LinkedIn and then and I'll, I'll connect with them. And uh, at the same time, uh, one of the things I'm really proud of, I'm going to share this real quickly. I know you got to go, but uh, on the at the end of this month, October 27th, I'm going to be going out to the uh, Marriott School of Business at BYU, where I have been selected to be the International Business Person of the Year for 2022. Wow. Congratulations. And so I've got four speeches I'm going to give out there to get the award tonight. Uh, Dick Marriott, who is uh, chairman of the board of Host Hotels, is one of the uh, boards that I, corporate boards that I serve on now, and the uh, dean of the uh, business school and the president. They'll do that award in the next morning. So I'm going to give a speech there, and they want the speech. You know, obviously, I'm going to decide what I say, and um, it's going to be. And obviously, this audience uh, not going to be a lot of people like you and me that that are in this audience, and we all need to be great communicators. And I'm going to tell a little bit of my story at a higher level, some of the things we talked about today and some of the challenges and what is it that we all can do to be allies, right, to make the world a better place to live in. So I'm very, very, and then I'm going to talk to the ROTC students. I'm going to talk to another three or 400 uh, uh, students, and then I'm going to uh, speak to the ROTC students as well. So I'm going, to, I'm going to end by talking about six things that I talk to when I do talk about mentorship. And for your young people out there, they need to know the difference between mentorship and sponsorship. Mentorship, you can ask for and you get it. And that person is telling you what it is you need to do to succeed. Sponsorship is what somebody says about you when you're not in the room. And you generally can't ask for sponsorship. You have to earn that. Because the other individual is putting their brand and reputation on the line when they recommend you for something. And that's the way that works. And I'm going to stop by talking about uh, most of my speeches when I talk to these uh, kids out at BYU. I'm going to talk about the six attributes of success from Herman Bulls. And those six attributes are your interpersonal skills. And that's your ability to interact with people. And you get good at that, not necessarily by being an extrovert, but by being something that you talked about today a continuous learner and curious, okay? Because if you're a continuous learner and curious, you're gonna have something to say to everyone. Uh, mm -hmm. the last week when I was in New York for this Reese event, I made it a point to go over and talk to the servers and tell them, how are you doing today? Did you have it today? You know why I do that, Lowe's? My mom was one of those people, okay? Mm -hmm. I can identify with them. And if somebody says something nice to you and it makes your day, don't forget the invisible people out there in the world. So that interpersonal skill needs to give you the opportunity to talk to the private or the general, the janitor or the CEO and everyone in between. And you do that by being a continuous learner and curious that you can talk about sports, politics, whatever you need to do. And if you're not informed, you're not going to be able to have good conversations. The second thing, something that you stress as well, communication skills. 
This includes this includes speaking, right? We need to articulate things that are particularly important. We also need to be able to write. And I get a little confused with all the the the, the shortcuts that the kids are doing on the <laughs> yeah. Right. And then more importantly, my mom used to say, you got two ears and one mouth. So use them in that proportion. You got to be a good listener. That's part of the uh, communications process. Uh, the second thing, the third thing is your analytical skills. Okay. Very, very important that young people, number one, understand that there's a reason that you take engineering and that's not your uh, engineering and that's not your, um, I'm getting a call here. I'm going to just put it on here, let them listen for a while. There's a reason that you take engineering and you're not going to be engineer. It's so that you can learn what those analytical skills are. And it's so important that as you're going through your process, get the uh, feedback from your supervisors on all of these, but particularly on how are my analytical skills. And analytical has, it's also the, the quantitative, but it's also the qualitative. And the quality mm. skills are the ones that you use as you go up the ladder in any organization you're in. The next thing is leadership, right? And West Point 101, leadership is that ability to influence a group to accomplish a common goal. And how are your leadership skills? And sometimes you lead, and you know from being in sports, you lead from the front, you lead from the middle, and you lead from the back. But it's all about what do we do to make the team better? And your leadership skills really is what helps you propel in an organization. Hmm. Next, we talk about entrepreneurship or risk taking, right? So I've jumped out of airplanes and, you know, that's a risk. And however, you have mitigations for that by having your main parachute and you have a reserve chute that you can get. So you can go down the middle of the road and you can probably be okay. However, taking risks doesn't mean you take risks just for the sake of taking risks. You always have a mitigating uh, plan, so to speak, if that risk doesn't work. For example, when I started the company that I told you about with SunTrust and Goldman Sachs, I could have gone back and just worked at JLL, but I took a risk. And my wife was there to support. We had insurance and we had saved money. And I put that money at risk. And, you know, worst case, if it didn't work, I just go back to work. You know, my kids aren't going to start. So be, but if you don't take a risk, if I had not done that, I don't think I'd be doing all the cool things I'm doing now. Hmm. And the last thing that I would say you have is passion. You have to have passion. And that passion, if it's contagious to those around you, it's going to make the team better and it's going to make you a more successful person. Well, Hermie, that was awesome. We got an extra bonus here tonight. <laughs> I want to say, uh, you know, thank you, man, for uh, taking the time out of your your busy schedule to to spend uh, with us this evening. Um, you know, I'm sure that the ripple effect is going to be some going to get it tonight, and this is continuous. Somebody's going to listen in the future, and they're going to be blessed by it. So, I want to say uh, thank you uh, for for sharing tonight. Um, man, it is a privilege to know you, man. And, uh, man, I look forward to staying in touch. Well, I'm looking forward to getting out on the links again. Matter of fact, I'm going to play golf tomorrow morning in a, in a little, little event here uh, over in Maryland. So I hope the weather it's, it's raining a little now. I hope <laughs> it clears up and we'll see what happens. Okay. All right. No, no problem. Thanks again. Appreciate you. You know, so I want to say to to everyone uh, who comes on each and every week, and if you're new, I want to say welcome, and I want to say thank you for your support. Man, I want to say God bless you. I love you guys, and I always say this every week. If you get to wake up tomorrow, make tomorrow your masterpiece. I love you guys, and see you next week. We really hope you enjoyed this episode of Lowe's Moore, the Blueprint Podcast. Stay connected and follow us at our website, www.lowesmore.com. That's L-O-W-E-S-M-O-O-R-E.com. You can also join the discussion on Twitter at Lowe's Moore and on Facebook at Lowe's Moore Jr. As always, thank you for pushing your mindset towards a better reality. This concludes the most thought-provoking portion of your day. 
Don't forget to like and subscribe to this podcast to stay fully up to date with everything we're up to. Until next time, be kind to yourself and each other. With the is a joke, I ain't buying it like I'm broke. Insufficient funds for insignificant